I'm Julie Herman of Jaybird Quilts, and welcome back to the Quilts for Baby and Beyond Sew Along. This week, we are going to work on making a quilt called Watch Me Grow. This quilt holds a special place in my heart as I designed it to document the growth of my son, Nathan. I have now used it to document the growth of my son, William, as well. This quilt features horizontal rows of colored triangles that help to showcase the growth of a child. The original quilt that I made featured eight Kona cottons in a rainbow. The second time I made this quilt, I used Tone on Tone Prints by Tula Pink, also in a rainbow. There are so many possibilities. Let's get started. The construction of Watch Me Grow is similar to what we did in the beginning when we worked on the triangles pillow. It's rows of triangles, to make up the entire project. The difference here is we're making a quilt and we're going to make a scrappy background from smaller triangles. The first step is to select your fabrics. Here I've cut the first two rows and I'm using Tula Pink solids in Cosmo and Taffy. So I've gone ahead and cut my large triangles and half triangles. Every other row has triangles or half triangles to finish the right and left edges. So go ahead and follow the directions that are on page 61 to make sure that you cut your odd rows with complete triangles and your even rows with half triangles on the right and left to finish the edges. After you have your feature fabric selected, it's time to work on your background. Now the background of this quilt was designed to use up scraps. So here you can see I have a variety of low volume tulip pink fabrics from assorted collections that I have set aside and I have cut small and larger triangles from my scraps. Those are going to be used to make two different blocks in the background, A and B, the large triangles and small triangles block. So the one is going to be made up of four larger triangles like this. And the other one is going to be made up of nine smaller triangles like this. And I am always kind of scrappy when I piece these. The only rule that I really have is that I won't put the same fabric next to each other. So for example, if I happen to pick up two of these, I wouldn't stick those right next to each other. I will duplicate within the same block as long as it's not the same fabric itself touching. So. And then I just try and make sure there's enough contrast from the background. So I might not wanna put this one, for instance, next to a blue, but since we're with pink right now, I'm very happy with that. So that is how the quilt is designed, um, a variety of these blocks and these blocks, and they kind of create a zigzag in their placement. So this would be another one of these, this would be another one of these down the quilt. Another option to save a little bit of time and piecing is if you don't have a ton of scraps or you're not interested or you just wanna save time, you can go ahead and cut background triangles to be the same size as your featured triangles and you can fill in with these. You can also do a variety of the pieced ones and the complete ones. There's no real rules here, it is your quilt, so I highly encourage you to do what makes you happy. And the same goes for the side um, half triangles. Those are blocks C and D, and you can go ahead and you can piece those, or you can go ahead and cut them from fabric to be the same size as these. So now I'm gonna head on over to the machine and show you how we're going to piece these blocks. Watch Me Grow contains two different types of pieced triangles that make up the background. One is made up of small triangles and one made of large. I'm gonna start with the one that is made with the larger triangles, and four of those make a block. You can be scrappy about this, you can plan it out, whatever makes you happiest. I generally am pretty scrappy. This nice stack was just cut from leftover fabrics and I usually just pick four and make sure that I don't have the same print duplicated. We're simply going to start by sewing two of these together. Similar machine settings to what we've been using so far on all the other quilts, which is a 2.5 stitch length and a scant quarter inch seam. Now we are working with two sides that are bias, one that is straight of green and as mentioned, we're going to be piecing this into a larger triangle. So this one, it doesn't really matter the orientation. With the outside ones, I like to leave the straight of grain side um, to be one of the outside seams and not start with the straight of grain on the inside. Um, your triangles will most likely have one notched corner 
Um, you can go ahead and notch all of them if you'd like, um, but it's not entirely necessary to help with alignment for this project. So I'm simply going to start with two triangles and place them right sides together. And so my can scant quarter inch seam. And I like to chain piece, so I'm just gonna go ahead and grab two more triangles for the next block that I'll be working on. And I'm just gonna keep piecing those. Here's that first piece that I sewed. I could go ahead and turn my iron on, but I'm simply going to just finger press this open and use my seam roller. That way I can stay at my machine to piece this entire block. If you feel like you get a flatter seam by going over to your iron, please feel free to do that. Um, do what is ever going to give you the best block uh, result that you are looking for. So um, I'm now going to take the third piece and place that on. And I think I want to do it this way. You can always feel free to rotate your piece around and decide which one you want to be the middle, the outside. You can change your mind. This is, this is scrappy, so there is no worries about any of that here. I'm simply going to take another pair. Now I have my three together. Again, I'm going to finger press this. I like to press my seams open. Things lay flatter that way. And also uh, when we go start to sew the complete triangles on, we're gonna have a lot less bulk here. Uh, so I find that extremely helpful. And I'm gonna go ahead now and add my last fourth triangle to make my first piece triangle block using my large triangles. Going to press this final seam open. And at this point, I usually would head over to the iron to press this block before I begin to piece it into a row. So now I'm going to follow the steps on the top left of page 62 to make as many of these blocks as I need. The second piece block that is used in the background contains the small triangles. And this block is made up of nine small triangles. Again, I go scrappy about this. I have a nice stack here that I've cut from leftovers of other projects. Anything that I thought was low volume enough to have a nice high contrast off of my background. I'm simply going to start by piecing these together into pairs. And again, green. Um, for most of these, doesn't matter. For the outside ones, I try and leave a straight piece, but even if you don't, that's okay. Um, Everything is going to go together very well when we piece these with our larger background triangles. Simply going to chain piece. Generally, I will make one block first, make sure that it looks good and everything is turning out how I like. And then once I have that one first block done, I will just go ahead and chain piece all the other blocks. So I'll do all my pairs and then I'll sew all my pairs into my next sets, so forth and so on. So I'm going to take these pieces and I'm going to press these seams open. And again, just as I did with the larger triangles, I'm just going to finger press and use my seam roller. I'm not going to turn my iron on yet. And so now I'm going to go ahead and press these two together to begin to make one of my rows. So I'm simply going to take advantage of any of the dog ears that have been created to line them up on top of the sharp points. And now I'm gonna take this pair and just sew one more triangle on to make my second row. Add it right here and again I'm going to use that dog ear, dog ear up there to that sharp point and I'm going to my trimmed point over here and 
And now I need to add one more piece to my top row. My top row is going to have five triangles. So I'm simply going to place this one here. And again, sharp point. And you see I have a lot of loose threads here. Some of these pieces, um, because I was cutting them from scraps, were not cut um, as on grain as I usually would make sure to cut things. Um, I'm not worried about that. Um, if the strings bother you, you can trim them off. I only really move them out of the way if they become a problem. Okay, so I'm gonna press this one. So this is my middle row, which has three pieces in it. And so now I'm going to sew my bottom piece on and then I'll take my top piece off, which has my five, and I'll be able to complete my piece to triangle. Okay, and so now I have my bottom triangle that has made up of my four and my top row that has my five, and I'm going to sew these together. And I could go ahead and do a hang pin at this point to make sure these line up. Um, since it's pretty small and everything is in the same value, I'm not going to do that. I'm simply going to just pin them in place. Um, but you could do a hang pin if you'd like. I will show you how to do that in just a few minutes when we get to sewing the rows together, as it's much more important of a technique when we're sewing the rows together since we will have high contrast um, triangles. So I'm simply just gonna line up this dog ear with this dog ear. And pin. Always want to remove your pins when, while you sew. Never want to sew over a pin. And when you get close, you can either use a stiletto, or sometimes if I don't have one right by me, I will use a small pair of scissors just to get all that bulk underneath the needle nicely. And there we go. Lined up pretty well. I'm happy with that. So I'm just going to go ahead and press this and then repeat the steps on the top right of page 62 to make as many of these triangles as needed. Once you have completed all of your block A and block B, it's time to make a few of blocks C and D. C and D are very similar, but add in some half triangles. These blocks will be used to finish the right and left edges of the quilt. This example here is a block D. It's shown this way in the book. So let me show that to you. And it is simply made up of three half triangles and three triangles. I've already gone ahead and sewn these two triangles together, and the assembly is going to be very similar to block B, which is the small triangles. We're gonna sew these two together and add this piece. We're gonna sew these two and add this piece, and then we're gonna sew this together. So let me show you how that works. So the half triangles are going to go together. You're gonna to sew a right and a left, which are mirror images. And you're gonna sew them together on their short side. And then to complete the top part, we are going to sew this half triangle to here. And this sharp point is going to line up with this dog ear. So it's very helpful that that's there. And there is not specifically going to be anything that's going to line up down here. If you need something to provide assistance to yourself here, you can go ahead and cut off that point um, using your super sidekick ruler, as I have shown in previous weeks, so that you have an extra piece there to help you with the alignment. It's small enough that I don't find that that's always necessary, but if it helps you, please, by all means, go ahead and do that. Your stitching should go right into the valley of where those two pieces meet. And now we're going to take off our first two that we sewed together and going to add this triangle here. And this is where, again, the um, you can rotate this until you get to um, a happy place. And I find it best to sew the blunt ends together here and the sharp points here so that I'll be able to line up that sharp point on top of that sharp point and this blunt right here. If I had trimmed the first one, that's what it would have looked like. Go ahead and sew those together. To finish sewing the half triangle D block, I need to go ahead and piece this top section to this bottom section and simply going to place those right sides together 
And you can pin here if you'd like, if you find it helpful, since it's right where I start, I'm not going to. And if you'd like to cut that off so you know exactly where the alignment is there, that's an option. I'm just going to sew scant quarter inch seam right to that valley to complete this half triangle block D. So now follow the steps on the bottom of page 62 to make the C and D blocks that are needed for your quilt. Now that I have pieced a couple blocks, I've brought them back over to my table, which I'm using as my design wall for now, and placed them into my quilt. And I think I'm gonna create a couple more to be used in my quilt, and I think I'm gonna supplement as well with a few complete triangles. So I'm gonna finish piecing those blocks, and then we'll get to assembling rows. Following the directions on page 63, lay out all the rows of your quilt. Put in your pieced triangles as well as your solid triangles. As mentioned, I have alternated and added some solid ones in along with my pieced ones. And then the next step is to begin to sew these into pairs. We're going to sew these with the same scant quarter inch that we've sewn the rest of the quilt with. So I'm simply going to begin by placing them right sides together. And since these are two complete triangles, I'm simply just going to sew the seam. No special attention needed. Now with the next pair, since I have a pieced triangle, I want to make sure that I don't lose these points. So I'm going to flip this piece onto this piece and sew this way. I wanna make sure that I don't do it this way because then I can't see my points so I have less information. As I've mentioned many times, I like the more information the better. So I'm going to sew with this piece on top. You can pin if you'd like. I am not going to pin at this point. I'm gonna pin when I begin to sew my pairs together into larger sections. And you can see here that it appears that this triangle is slightly smaller than that triangle. That happens sometimes. Um, either my seams were a little too generous here, things shrunk up a little bit. All I'm gonna do is give this a slight little pull now that I have about four or five stitches in. So I'm gonna just slightly pull that, line it up here, and sew those two together. And I'm gonna pay close attention to where my point is here when I get close to the needle to make sure that I sew right to the point. And as you can see here, things are kind of bowing in a little bit. I'm gonna pull that back out just so that that point is also a quarter of an inch from the edge. This is also a good opportunity if you have a stiletto to use your stiletto, or again, small pair of scissors can serve the same purpose. And so you're just gonna continue this process, sewing pairs together until you have sewn all the pairs to put one row together. I've sewn all of my pairs and now it is time to press them. So I'm over at my pressing station and I'm going to press these open. It's gonna help alleviate bulk when I go to sew my rows together since I'm going to have lots of seams coming together. So I suggest finger pressing open and then getting your heat resistant stiletto. And fun fact about this is this was invented by Joan Hawley, who our community recently lost. Uh, she was a very near and dear friend of mine and uh, I can see her and find her everywhere in my studio, including this. Um, this was one of the many tools that Joan invented. Um, if you don't know about Joan of Lazy Girl, I highly suggest um, you look her up. She was an incredible, amazing bag and quilt designer and ruler designer. And I would not be where I am today and would not have invented the rulers I did and the patterns I did without her guidance. So thank you, Joan, for, for being an awesome, awesome mentor to me. I'm gonna try and keep it together here. Um, so go ahead and press. And remember that pressing, uh, we wanna be pressing and not ironing. Uh, pressing is up and down, ironing is back and forth. We don't wanna stretch any of the bias that we're working with here. So again, finger press open. And when you have things like this, they're gonna have a tendency to want to 
um, not open as easily. So that's definitely when your heat resistance to let out. It's got the silicone end here. It's going to help so you don't need to get your finger anywhere close to the iron. So use your stiletto to hold your fabric down and it doesn't matter if your iron touches it because it won't burn it like it would burn your finger. So you're just gonna walk along, pressing as you go, making sure you don't push an iron, go up and down with a little wiggle. And that will give you exactly what you need. And sometimes I do also flip it to the front, give it a good press from the front as well to get it nice and flat. And I'm going to stack my blocks as I go so that I don't lose the order so let me get them in the frame so you can see so this was the first one that i pressed and then this is the next one so i'm going to stack them like this until i get back to my design wall so that i make sure that i don't lose track of the order i did also snap a photo before i started piecing i find that's very helpful and if you've never tried doing that before using a cell phone is a great um, tool to take a picture so that in case you forget in case things fall off your design wall. I know kids and cats uh, tend to love knocking things off design walls. Um, so very helpful to snap a picture, um, but I do my best to try and keep things in order so I don't mix them up. So I'm just going to finish pressing my blocks and then head back on over to the sewing machine to piece these into a completed row. I'm back over here at my machine with my newly pressed blocks for my first row. And I also have my half block that is going to start my row that I need to add on. So I want to begin with this one. So I'm simply going to spin this around so I don't lose track of anything and pull the first block out and slide these over, keeping them together. And when it comes to alignment for this set, I have my sharp point here to my sharp point. And I don't have anything here to tell me where to align that to. So I can eyeball it if I'm comfortable or I can go ahead and trim the sharp point off. I'll show you real quick how I can do that. You can do this with your super sidekick, sidekick, hexamore, mini hexamore. This is the one that I keep right by my machine, so it's super easy and convenient to do on a small cutting mat by my machine. It would, it would be kind of hard to have the super sidekick over here in front of my machine. Simply lining the ruler up so that I have this line and this line of the ruler aligned with those two sides of the triangle, and going to trim my sharp point off. Okay, slide all this out of the way. And now I know exactly where to line that up. So when I flip this on here, I'm gonna line it up right there. Put a pin in so nothing shifts. And then down here, I'm going to line my sharp point up with my sharp point, put that in place. And again, I'm going to sew with this piece on top so that I don't lose any of my points just as I did for sewing the first sets of blocks together into the rows. I'm gonna remove my pins as I go. Again, never wanna sew over pins. And you can see here, you can see some of the purple peeking through. My seam wasn't perfect there. That's okay. I wanna shoot to be right onto where those points come together because that's what you're gonna see on the other side. And again, that's the same thing I'm gonna shoot for right here. Okay. And if your pin is out of the way of your needle, you can wait to remove it. You only need to make sure you remove it if your pin is going to go under your needle because you never want your pin and your um, needle to intersect. Um, you can bend pins that way, break needles, all kinds of things that we don't, we don't want to do. So I'm going to take this stack now and I'm going to slide the next two out and slide them apart. And this is where they're gonna go together. And I could choose to pin this or not. Um, since I just pinned the last one, I'm gonna show how I do this without pinning. And I have sharp point here to sharp point here. And I have a sharp point here to no point, so I can either eyeball it, which is what I'm gonna do, or I can trim that off like I just did with the last one. I'll show you how both work out. So I'm gonna line up those two sharp points. And I am going to just keep my finger here to make sure that this doesn't slide up or down. Um, that's important when you're not pinning. If you have issues with things sliding, then I do suggest pinning. Again, I'm gonna grab my stiletto, make sure I keep everything nice and flat. And I'm going to continue this process, piecing these into sets and then I will piece all of these to each other in the same manner until I have this row complete. I 
I have finished sewing all of my pairs together and I didn't press as I was going since none of my seams intersected. So now I have all of these seams to press to complete my row. And I'm gonna do that in the same manner that I pressed these, which is I'm going to finger press them open, grab my heat resistant stiletto and just simply press. I often do like to use steam. I don't use it all the time when I am recording because it gets pretty loud and it fogs up the camera, um, but I do like steam. So when I am done pressing these on the back, I will turn this over to the front and turn the steam on and give it a good press. I need to keep pressing, but I'll show you what that looks like. And then once I have this pressed, I'm going to go complete the rest of my rows so that I can piece them together. So with my steam, I'll simply go up and down to give every one of my seams a good press. I have assembled and pressed my rows and now it's time to put my rows together. And here is when I, where I want to make sure that I'm really ma matching things up so that I have these crisp triangles that match up with the points. So how I'm going to do that is with a technique called the hang pin. So let me show you how we do that. And one note before I start is that all of your rows are going to have complete triangles on one seam and pieced and possibly complete triangles on the other. So we wanna sew always with this piece on top and this piece on the bottom so that we can again make sure we don't lose our points the same way when we were sewing our pieces together. So I'm gonna flip these together, but I'm going to work from this side so that I make sure that I don't lose any of these points. So the hang pin, I've shown many times before, but I'm gonna show it to you again, is a great technique that you can use to make sure that you're properly lining up one point to another, row to row, and if your seam is not perfectly a quarter inch here, that's okay, because we're going to match up that point to that point. So here's how we do that. We're going to take a pin, and we're going to start by placing that pin right where our point, where all of our seams intersect. Look at it from this side, make sure that we're good. Then we're going to place it in on our second piece. And what we're going to do is we're going to push these two pieces together and we're going to let that pin hang there, hence the name hang pin. Now, we want to make sure that we keep this pin perpendicular to our fabric. We don't want it tilting this way or this way because if it does, our points are going to shift. So we wanna make sure it's staying a perfect little plus sign and then we're simply going to take two other pins and place them on either side of the hang pin. And what that does is it keeps our fabric together. We obviously can't sew with the sewing machine with a pin hanging down like that. So we wanna put these pins in place to keep that piece exactly where it should be. And it looks like I lost my, it's hard sometimes demoing and doing it at the same time. My pin got a little crooked, so I wanna make sure that I keep that perfectly straight before I put my two pins on the sides and pull that hang pin out. My pin is sticking to my scissors, being a magnet when I don't want it to be a magnet. Okay, and then I'm going to pull that out. And I'm going to repeat this process for every intersection. It might seem like a lot and it is, but in this quilt where we have a light background and then big bold triangles, I've worked so hard with all my piecing and cutting up to this point, I want to make sure that you can see that in the finished quilt and you can notice you know, the child and the growth of a child and you're not seeing some wonky point. I want you to see these clean, crisp rows of color um, when my quilt is complete. So it's worth it to me to take the time right now to pin every one of these. So I'm going to keep doing the same thing, put the hang pin in and then pin on either side. And sometimes I do that where I pull the hang pin out to pin on the side. Um, sometimes that backfires on me. So um, not the best habit of mine, um, but yeah, you, you put it into this side, check over here, make sure it's good. Put it into the next one. Keep it nice and straight. Wiggle things around a little bit if you need to to keep that nice and straight. And then put one pin on either side. I've got 
two more to do. Now I have all of those pinned. I have not yet pinned um, my ends. I just have my five intersections of hang pins. And what my next step is, is going to be to do what I call a little bit of stay stitching. It's kind of a mix between stitching and basting. Um, it's on the line where we want to be, so it's more like stitching, but it is, um, also kind of like basting, but I feel like basting is usually, you know, more in the seam allowance. Here's, I'm going to show you what I mean. So I have my machine set up to my scant quarter and seam. And instead of sewing the full length of this piece and then finding out somehow I messed up three of these, something shifted along the way, and I now have to unpick the whole thing. I'm just going to sew one inch at each of these. And then I'm going to open the piece up, take all the pins out, open the piece up and check them. And if one or two or three of them is off, I only have to unpick that one inch, fix it, sew that one inch, and then once I know I'm good, I'm going to sew the length of the entire seam. So let me show you what that looks like. So again, I don't have this pinned here yet, and I'm not starting up here, I'm starting right here. And I'm going to start right past that pin. So it's gonna be between three quarters of an inch and an inch that you're gonna sew at each one of these and nice and slow and using your stiletto so that your needle goes right on top of your points. And you can either um, just move it up and snip those threads later, or if you have an automatic thread cutter, you can use that, whatever feature um, in your machine works best. And if you are getting too close to these pins, make sure that you remove them as you go. I'm sewing on the inside of them, so I'm not going to remove them just yet. So again, now I'm at my third one, and you can see right here that I've got all this extra purple peeking out. And it looks like because I was a little more generous down there than I was up here. So that's okay that I have that peeking out. I don't need to try and cover that all up. Um, so I just wanna focus on getting right to that point. And I know this feels like it's a lot of extra time, and it is. Um, it can seem like that, and it, it is on the front end, but I find um, for myself that a few extra minutes here saves me time later um, in not having to remove things. I'm not a fan of using my seam ripper any more than I have to. Um, it's a great tool to have and to be able to use when you need it, um, but it's not necessarily a fun tool, so I'd rather spend a little more time making sure things are accurate so I'm just gonna take my little scissors and snip these threads. And now I'm going to pull out all my pins and check to see how accurate all of my hang pins were. And if I get four out of five right, I'm happy. Inevitably, I don't always get them all right, and that's okay, but we're gonna see. All right, that one looks great. I'm super happy with that one. That one looks pretty good. Um, it looks like maybe I was a little too scant in my seam just now, and if I was a little more generous, I would get a little more of that purple, um, but I don't think I need to take that one out. That one again is pretty good. Okay, then that one again, I think I need to be a little more generous um, to get closer to those points. And yep, four out of five, and I <laughs> that was just a guess because statistically that's where I am. So. Somehow I ended up snipping off a little bit too much. Um, so yeah, if you look at this side, I was sewing from this side and it looked great here. But if you look at this side, whoa, something happened, something shifted and I ate, you know, way too much of the fabric. So I'm gonna unpick this and I'm going to use my hang pin to fix this um, before I sew the length of the entire piece. So you can do your uh, hang pin you can do your hang pin from either side. When you go to sew the length of the seam, I suggest that you have this piece on top, but I'm gonna do my hang pin from this side since this is where I had the trouble, and it seems like I'm a little more scant on this side. So I'm just gonna start by putting my pin through. And that looks good. And then I'm going to put it through again. Okay. 
And you see here that there is a, a significant difference um, in where my purple pieces line up to my white pieces. And that is where it should be since somehow I ended up with too scant of a seam here. I don't want to pull this up to match. Then I'm going to end up with my problem again. I want to leave it down where it needs to be. And I will just end up easing it up to here later on. Right now I'm just focused on this point. So I'll put my pens on either side and let's just sew this one, see how it turns out. Oh, my needle came unthreaded. It would help if my needle is threaded. Um, I go through all the same things that you guys go through. Don't think that you are alone in having mistakes and in having things not line up and starting to sew without your needle threaded or with no thread in your bobbin. I've been there. I've done it all. Okay, so let's pull these pins out and hopefully it looks a little better this time much better and you can actually see the holes they'll go away but you can see that's where it was last time that's like almost an eighth of an inch um, too far in so now that I have all of those sewn I'm going to come back on this side and I'm going to pin my corners um, just to get these pieces to line up and this is eventually where my binding is going to go it, it might seem like a lot of work to sew something um, like this in this manner that is not that wide of a quilt. Um, this quilt is only 42 inches wide um, and it is a little bit of extra work. This is definitely something I always do if I'm working on a queen or a king, um, but I just find that taking that little bit of extra time, you know, that, that one piece that was off just there, that would have been a real bummer if um, I had to unpick a significant portion of this seam just to fix that one point. Um, in this case, I only had to unpick one inch of stitching. So I am going to start here and I'm going to backstitch since I don't, this is a borderless quilt and I know this is the end of my seam. Pull these pins out as I go and I'm just going to shift this over um, so that my points end up a quarter of an inch underneath right at where the needle is. And if you end up with a bubble like this, um, you just want to slightly pull because we know everything is lined up here. So we don't want to take this out. So it just means that there's a little more fabric here than here that happens sometimes. So we just want to give a slight little tug like that, not a big tug, just a slight little tug. And we're going to stitch from here to this point to right to where our stitching um, that we already did is. Nice and slow, there's no hurry at this point. And now I'm going to stitch for that little um, three quarters of an inch to one inch section just right on top of the thread that's already there. And then again, the same thing. We're going to stitch from here to here and then here to here. It's kind of like connect the dots along the length of the seam. And in this case, I have, it looks like a little more pink fabric than this. So it's bubbling on the bottom. So again, just give it a little bit of a tug. Because I know my blocks are lined up where they should be. Whenever you have an eighth of an inch or less in a situation like this, you can generally ease that in. If, you, if your bubble is significant, um, let me show you kind of an example. I'll make it exaggerated. So like if you had a bubble like that, you can't ease that in. There's no stretch that's gonna ease that in. You would have to either create a pleat or take something out or, or do a bigger fix. Um, but an eighth of an inch, um, all the way up to sometimes even close to a quarter, depending on how long the span is, you can ease in. Um, there's lots of ways to fix little boo-boos along the way so that nobody will ever see them. Completed sewing my first two rows together. So now it is time to press these. And I could press this open um, the way that I have pressed everything so far. And I did do that um, when I made this quilt before. This time though, I think because of my bulk down here and my darker colors, I think I'm gonna press up towards the triangles. I'm simply going to flip over to this side. And again, pressing is up and down with a little bit of a wiggle. I wanna make sure you're not pushing your iron 
And when I press to the side, I tend to press from the back first and then flip my piece over and give it a nice press from the front. This is where steam really comes in handy. So after I get this pressed, I'm just gonna continue this process to add the rest of the rows to complete my quilt top. Binding directions on how to complete a rectangular quilt. Um, I went over those when we did cuddles and the link is below. If you have any questions, please leave those in the comments. Thank you for tuning in here today. If you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to like it, share your comments with us, and subscribe to this channel. You can also turn on notifications for this channel to receive an alert when we post new videos. We're looking forward to seeing your Watch Me Grow quilts. Share them with us on social media using hashtag JBirdBaby. I'll be back here next week to guide you through making the color wheel quilt. See you soon.